Now there's all kinds of different people in this world. There's only one high. Welcome to the Teammate Apart Podcast, the podcast designed to teach freelancers, contractors, and remote workers, really anyone working apart, how to build better relationships with those they work with and those they work for. I'm your host, Ryan Rogar. Before we get started, financial support for the Teammate Apart Podcast Season 2 is provided by R2, a fully distributed brand relationship consultancy. R2 has specific expertise and experience in helping service companies grow, develop, and maintain impactful relationships through world-class brand strategy and design. R2 supports the world's best distributed companies by providing valuable insights, strategy, empathy, and tactical expertise to help them foster truly meaningful relationships from top management to top consumer. If the success of your business depends on the relationships you make, then you need R2. To learn more or to request a call, simply visit r2mg.com slash podcast. That's r2mg.com slash podcast. R2, relationships squared. Also, financial support comes from teammateapart.com. Leveraging 20 plus years of global agency and creative hiring expertise, Teammate Apart provides distributed organizations with access to the best and brightest creative talent from around the world. Through deep understanding of client needs and meaningful relationships with talent, Teammate Apart facilitates a sort of virtual handshake between prospective employer and prospective employee to reduce risk and eliminate doubt from creative hiring decisions. Take a step towards filling that creative shaped void in your distributed team by visiting teammateapart.com slash talent. That's teammateapart.com slash talent to learn more. Finally, financial support comes from supporters like you. Members of our happy little podcast community can make contributions directly to the show by visiting teammateapart.com slash podcast and clicking on the donation link. Donations can be in any amount and go a long way towards keeping this show on the air. If you appreciate the work we're doing and would like to get involved, just visit teammateapart.com slash podcast, click the donate button, and you're on your way. Thank you for your continued support. And now, on to the show. Hey there, and welcome back to the show. This week, we have special guest Tom Ross. Tom is the CEO and founder of Design Cuts, a community of more than half a million broadly distributed creative people building affordable design assets to support artists and creatives around the world. In addition to his company, much of his time is dedicated to helping his fellow creative people improve their marketing to build better businesses. He does this via his widely read email newsletter, his social media channels, and on his podcasts, The Honest Designer Show and The Biz Buds Podcast that he co-hosts with creative industry legend Michael Janda. Here to talk about remote leadership, adaptation amid pandemic, finding and hiring candidates from around the world, the gig economy, and so much more, please join me in welcoming to the show, Tom Ross. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'd like to introduce our guest, Tom Ross. Tom, welcome to the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks so much for having me on, Ryan. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great. So for people who have no uh, background in where we come from or whatever, I had the opportunity to meet Tom in Georgia a couple of years ago at a Creative South uh, Design Conference or Creativity Conference out there in Georgia. Uh, it was actually his first time there, my first time there, and, uh, and I had the great pleasure of meeting Tom there. So this this podcast has been more or less, you know, a year and a half in the making. And, uh, and I'm really grateful for your time, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I know you took me under your wing as a first time conference goer. So I'm glad we could rekindle things. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's it, it's so great. I'm, I'm thrilled for this. So let's, um, I guess, kind of start at the beginning a little bit. Let's just give a little back, background on who you are, what you do, and, uh, you know, where where we fit in in this conversation. Sure. So I've been doing the whole creativity, design, entrepreneurship, marketing thing since a very young age. But for the last seven years, I've been the founder and CEO of my company, designcuts.com, which is the highest rated marketplace in the world for designers. So that's my baby and my passion, and I love it. And then alongside that, I run my personal brand where I just help as many creatives with business and marketing as I possibly can because I'm a huge geek about that stuff and I get tremendous fulfillment trying to help others with it. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's, I think it's one of the coolest things that I'm seeing happening lately in sort of the creative environment is, is so many people like you sort of giving of yourselves, right? I think that this is, uh, especially now during COVID and all this stuff, I think the 
willingness of people to sort of give of themselves and offer these uh, resources. And you're one of the, the you know, biggest producers I'm aware of in terms of uh, content and things like that that you're giving out basically at no charge to help people level up their creative business. And uh, I, I think that's really valuable. I think it's good to see people helping people. Thank you. It's fun. That's the answer, really. It's, uh, it's really fun for me. Well, I guess that's how you know it's working, right? So, so one of the things, so, I mean, for, for listeners to this show, obviously we spend a lot of time discussing remote work and how remote work is changing and evolving and, and things like that. Obviously, Tom, as a, you know, running this giant marketplace, you work with creative people from all over the planet. They're coming in from, you know, points unknown as different creative resources who are capable of doing different things. And so I wondered if you'd talk about first, just sort of a little bit, you know, what goes into your sort of day to day in terms of leading remote teams? If we're trying to help, you know, the world's best companies find the best creative talent, you know, what sorts of things are you doing to, uh, to start, I guess, putting people on that path? Absolutely. It's a great question. And just to bring a bit of context to this, I was historically against going remote because I used to work, um, you know, in my freelance days from home and I started going a bit stir crazy by the end of it. And I actually initially felt uncomfortable going into an office environment and then I thrived. I was like, man, I love being around people every day. This is great. It gives me structure, gives me motivation and, and discipline and so on. So I was really settled in that kind of office environment, being around people all day. And then COVID hit and we had to shut the office up temporarily. And the plan was we were gonna go back at the end of this year. And now we permanently closed the office. So there is no more office. We're entirely remote now as a team. Which oh, wow. That's, yeah, that is awesome. And, and, you know, and I think it's sort of indicative of the times too. You know, it's funny that you mentioned the anxiety and the isolation, sort of the, the ways that you were feeling as a freelancer, because I think obviously those are really common to people in the creative industry, but also just remote workers in general. These are really common feelings. Um, but, and I, I'm sort of with you, maybe it's just got to do with sort of, a, you know, general age range. I don't know exactly how old you are, but I think we're sort of contemporary. 32. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, see, so I'm much older than you. I'm 40. And so, um, but I sort of come from, (laughs) well, thanks. I'll take that. My secret is always carry an extra 30 or 40 pounds that, uh, (laughs) that keeps the wrinkles full. Um, so, but, uh, so my move is, or, or, you know, my experience was sort of the same. I started out as a freelancer working, you know, at night while I was had had a day job and, and kind of working on my own. And eventually I had the opportunity to go down and work for an ad agency. And I found too, that in my experience, I loved the office, right? I loved having these people around me and all these creative folks all around that I could just bounce ideas off of and that we could share time with, uh, you know, one another. And so for me, I really enjoyed that too. However, you know, in my uh, spare time, I guess we'd call it, I was working remotely from home and, uh, and I did spend an awful lot of time by myself and I I too have experienced those uh, things. And so I think when COVID hit, so many people were forced to go remote, but they, you know, ultimately, you know, I think many of them left with one toe back in the office and then much like your experience have decided to maybe not go back. Yeah. So can you talk um, a little bit about that decision? Like, I mean, cause that is a pretty you know, dr- dramatic move. Absolutely. Um, like I say, even when we had to temporarily close the office, I never considered it. And then I started to notice that I was quite enjoying it and our team seemed to be quite enjoying it being remote and it seemed to be working surprisingly well. So all of the reservations and fears we had actually weren't really playing out how we expected. And we really care about our teams. So I actually did a survey and got feedback from every single team member about the situation because I didn't want to just make the decision and not include them in that. If they all wanted to keep the office, we would have kept paying for it, even though we weren't using it. We would have gone back after, even though it personally might not suit me at that point. You know, we want to make our team happy. But it came back and it was basically unanimous. Everyone was saying, I got a two hour commute every day. And this suits me way better. I get to spend more time with family and loved ones. The communication weirdly went up as well, not down. So um, I think previously, whereas two people might have a private conversation in the office, now we use Slack and we have done for years, but everything's now on Slack. And so everything's out in the open. Communication weirdly not being around each other rose and improved. And so that was very surprising. And so we basically looked at it and thought, well, If the team prefer it and we prefer it and everyone's working better and more productively and they're happier and communicating better, 
why are we paying for this fancy office? Yeah, and no, so I think that I think forced that's our right. hand. Yeah, well, and I think it's one of those things, right? Especially um, people with maybe, you know, I, I hate to call them older uh, management styles, but sort of people who, you know, think of the sort of in-office uh, experience as being the best experience. Um, I think so much of going remote has to do with trust, you know, like we feel like we trust our people when we're in and around, you know, their environment and, and we're working with one another up close and we, we feel pretty good about all that stuff. But I think when we're faced with this prospect of now we're going to let people go home, there's this, you know, bit of trust or this like kind of doubt that creeps in where we go, well, God, how's this going to go, you know? And so I think, you know, I mean, if you're looking for silver linings in and around COVID, I think this is one of them, right? The people were sort of forced into an environment where their hand was forced, as you mentioned, and all of a sudden, you know, everybody rose to the occasion. Yeah. Yeah. And it does take on a slightly different managerial style. So we've never been micromanagers in my organization, but I think it forces you to look more at the outcome and the output of team members, as opposed to like the day-to-day -day minutia of what's being achieved, because you can't and wouldn't want to stand over their shoulder watching everything they do. So you just have to trust that they're kind of out of sight and at points out of mind, you have to just pay attention to, are they hitting their KPIs? Are they shipping enough work overall? And it's the kind of net net win of that, right? It's the net output of the team. Who knows? Maybe sometimes they're off for an hour, lying in a hammock in the garden. I, yeah. I can't monitor that without having some kind of weird spy camera and I don't want to. <laughs> so as long as they're, you know, happy and treating other team members well and doing great work and doing enough work to our expectations, then, you know, we don't have to micromanage. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and I think that that is the, the realization that so many people have when they do go remote. Um, the, the managers who tend to struggle are those who, you know, did, you know, are kind of micromanagers or maybe don't have a great style. But one of the things I really like, and I, I would maybe like to just sort of talk about sort of in terms of kind of a life skill or a management skill, you know, as you're trying to run a company managing creative talent remotely, is this idea of adaptation. So, I mean, obviously COVID forced our hand and all of a sudden you were, you're now working remotely and, you know, just by happenstance, you ended up liking it. There are plenty of people who don't. Mm -hmm. but, um, but what I like about that story is this idea of adaptation and this idea of fluidity. I think that, you know, this is one of the, the topics that keeps coming up lately and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it is just embracing this fluidity and sort of going with the flow for lack of a better term. And, uh, and I think that, you know, it's smart. It sounds like, you know, you mentioned some of the key things like, you know, measuring KPIs and looking at outputs and things like that. You know, these are the, the, the critical elements of ran, running a remote team. But I think all that came about, and if you weren't working remotely prior, you know, maybe some of these processes and things like this had to be developed as a result of this adaptation. And so I wonder if you talk yeah. a little bit about that, you know, maybe how you did things before versus how you've done them now and, and how it's, you know, different if it is. It's not dramatically different because, like I say, we never micromanaged. What it's done is it has, it's led to just a greater degree of trust and not feeling like I need to look around the office and be like, come on, guys, get back to work or anything like that. It's just, it, we've had to trust in the results. That's what it comes down to. And where it has changed and improved is I actually genuinely think my communication as a manager and many of our managers have got better talking to each other so previously i'd have a busy day in the office i might not actually touch base with everyone you know individually whereas now the people that i directly manage i'm checking in every day you're having a good afternoon you know morning like how's it going i'll jump on the call occasionally and be like just want to see how everything is quick five minute catch up so there's so much communication and one thing we do is we have a morning meeting every single monday on zoom and everyone jumps on and it's kind of like me talking about the week ahead, but equally there's a social element to it. So how was everyone's weekend? We're there with mugs of coffee. This is our mm. water cooler moment. And I think that's really important. Um, and equally it doesn't happen every week, but we started organizing like, you know, monthly Friday drinks where people finish early and everyone gets drunk on a zoom call and that kind of thing. So yeah. you kind of get the social dynamic and we're definitely going to be enforcing monthly meetups so even though some people are a little further away with where they're based, they're willing to make the journey once a month, if not every day. So we're going to all get together, have a big strategy day and then go down the pub and that kind of thing. COVID allowing, of course. Yeah. But, you know, all of those things, um, they make you more intentional. 
I think in an office, you can just take the dynamic for granted. It is what it is. Whereas now we're more intentional. You know, I'm much more aware of how close I am with my people and how often I'm checking in and how they're doing. Weirdly, I'm more aware of that than when they were sat three feet away from me. Yeah, no, it's interesting how that works. And it's funny that you mentioned the word intention. I've got it written down here on my notes and I've circled it about four times because I wanted to circle back to this idea of, uh, you know, because you mentioned, you know, now people are communicating a lot. You've moved primarily to Slack as a communication tool, you know, in addition to video call and a couple other things. But I mean, but I think you're right. There's this aspect of intention where, you know, in order for you to be a great communicator when working remotely, you must put in some effort. And I think that that effort is actually what contributes to greater levels of trust and that ability to sort of, I guess, meet our KPIs and things, right? I mean, we may, like you said, in an office environment, sort of take it for granted, kind of easy to slack off or what, whatever. And, uh, but when you're fully remote and everything is sort of transparent, like you're really on the hook if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing. Like it's very clear if you're not doing your job. And so I think that this uh, this intention, whether it's on purpose or not, you know, becomes sort of the driver behind some of the things that uh, make the remote office work. I think if our team were the kind of team that only worked hard and well because they had a manager breathing down their neck, then they wouldn't be a good team. So it shouldn't be that that is a necessary step. That actually infers that you might have the wrong people or you might be the wrong manager. I think if you truly have the best people, it shouldn't be a necessity. And that's for a few reasons. You know, we've got better and better at hiring. So we've made some unbelievably good recent hires. And, you know, one of them is pretty senior. She's up working with me till like midnight every night. I've never asked her to. She's just super passionate and invested. That's not me forcing her to do that. We just hired someone that's amazing. There's more junior people that work more regular hours, but guess what? They always show up and work hard and get the work done, partly because they're invested and partly because they're great, but also partly because they care about their teammates and they recognize in a small team, forget your manager. Like if you screw up or, or you're lazy or you slack off, there's a knock-on effect to your friends and teammates who are on your same level. So you don't, you don't want to let them down because mm -hmm. you let the family feel down of the team. So these are the, the reasons, I think, why people work hard. Um, and I actually, it's so, so funny, Ryan, I listened to a podcast, one of my favorite podcasts earlier this morning, and the guy was talking about this type of thing. And there, there was a science experiment, I believe, where they had these different groups of people and they were playing with motivational factors as to why they worked hard and why they didn't. So there was one group that was getting paid a small amount of money to do some tasks. And then the same tasks were given to another group who got paid quite a high amount of money. And the group with the higher amount of money predictably outperformed the group with the lower amount of money as a motivation. But there was a third group that were asked just to do it as a favor for no money at all. And they outperformed both of the other groups. Oh, interesting. And it's talking about um, business norms versus societal norms. And actually money and these transactional things where you're invoicing for your time and so on, there's kind of a ceiling to your motivation inherently tied to that. But where you get into societal norms of doing it as a favor or for a friendship or to look out for your people because you truly care on a more emotional level, that's where you get a much higher yield in terms of output and motivation from people. And so I think a lot of these things come into play in this new world that we're living in, this new remote, remote work environment. Yeah, no, and I think it's especially true, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit in that you've been a creative guy yourself and have worked in and around creatives. I think that people who are sort of, and, and of course, just to preface, I'm using creatives as sort of a catch-all for people who work in sort of creative professions. So it could be copywriters, UX designers, whatever. I think some of these characteristics sort of apply to everyone. But I, I've noticed, at least in my experience working in and around creative people, this willingness to give and like you mentioned this team dynamic where they're trying to not let people down on their team i think is super common in in, in creative fields anyway i mean i know a million designers that are work overnight to get jobs done and it's not because they're dying to work overnight but it's because they're passionate about their work and uh and i i see sometimes that gets exploited in places but i think that if managed well 
and everybody is sort of happy, you know, and, and not being overworked or burned out or whatever. And they're, they're balancing plenty of time off with plenty of time on. I think that there's a way to sort of capitalize on that passion. And so the example that you just showed or shared with the, uh, you know, the group of people who are working and basically outperforming everyone on a favor, I believe that that's sort of a trait of the designer, sort of a trait of a character, uh, creative person. And maybe it's sort of a, I don't know, the, the artistic bits or whatever. I don't know what it is, but there's, there's something going on in there where, where this breed of people, you know, are really willing to give that way. And, and I shouldn't, you know, seclude other people. Maybe other people are this way as well, but my experience is in around creative people. Yeah, mine too. I love this community and you and I are perhaps a bit biased, Ryan, but um, yeah, I think creatives are like some of the nicest, hardest working, most awesome people. And that leads yeah. to a, a trustworthy, amazing team. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think, you know, there's obviously room for abuse. I think there are people who take advantage of the the kind of hard work that a designer would put in, you know, that they would work overnight or they would do whatever to try and try and please you. And I think sometimes too, at least in, in my experience, sort of an agency culture, it's a little bit of a badge of honor to be the guy that worked overnight. So I don't think it's long-term sustainable, but I no. think generally speaking, um, yeah, creative people are, are great for that. Um, I wondered if you would talk about, you, you mentioned having made some recent hires. Were those sort of in the, in the before time or have you had to do any hiring during COVID and sort of, you know, the, the new world? Yeah, plenty. We're actually hiring quite a bit at the minute. Um, can you talk a little bit then about your hiring process and what that's like? So when, you know, if I'm a designer and I'm in the creative field and I'm looking to, you know, maybe now find a position remotely with design cuts or, you know, anybody for that matter, you know, what sorts of things are you looking for in hiring process? I mean, it sounds like you're, uh, you know, finding some success with the hires you're finding. So you must be doing something right. Yeah, we really are. Like, I, I don't say this lightly. We've got really good at hiring. And I'm proud of that because it definitely wasn't always that way. It's a skill like anything else. And I think we've really found a good framework and a good system that we work um, within. And I've learned that it's better to invest more time and effort upfront rather than make a slightly off hire. And then it hits you down the line, six months, two years, whatever it might be. Um, it can be a bit grueling, especially if you urgently need that hire and you, you're tempted just to kind of settle or go for the person that doesn't feel quite right at interview but it always comes back to bite you. So we're super fussy now. Um, we have a kind of multi-tiered process. So um, we often use a team of recruiters. They will then go out and find suitable people. We put various vetting stages with the recruiter. So people generally shouldn't touch us unless they're already a very good fit. Um, and we kind of train the recruiters and how to do that. Then um, for certain roles, we might have something like a quick exercise quiz something like that where people can actually demonstrate their talent or show something. Nothing enormous, but I found it's really important because people can often talk the talk, but when it comes down to it, they can't actually execute as they've advertised. And this is particularly true of people like, you know, in marketing and so on, because they're very good at the razzle dazzle. But then when you sit them down and it's like, what can you actually do? They sometimes don't back it up. And so we, we definitely have that kind of hands on interactive element to it as well where people can actually deliver and prove themselves and there's been people who are impressive on a phone interview phase or something like that and then they put in their deliverable and you're like oh no that's really not what we were expecting and it it doesn't waste people's time because previously they might have gone through you know subsequent rounds and then started and then it wouldn't have worked out a month in it's better mm. to know at this phase um so as I say, there's other phases like phone interview and then you have a sit down interview or in this you know, era, a Zoom interview, a video interview. Um, the phone interview is normally the key manager uh, or sometimes myself or you know, the HR person on our team. And then the Zoom interview would be with all the appropriate people. So it might be myself, um, another director, and then the person's potential future manager or something like that. So it's more of a group dynamic. And then within all of that, this goes for like my day-to-day -day operational style, but certainly my interview style is just about like complete radical transparency and honesty from the word go. And what I used to do, and this was a big learning lesson, I would almost oversell and overpromise the job spec and the role because I was so like excited about it. I wanted to get them excited. 
and it was almost like me selling myself and the company and the role to them. Oh, it's the best thing ever. It's good, you know, dream role. Da, da, da. And then invariably they would join and it would be a great role, but it wouldn't actually live up to the hype, which I initially gave in some cases. And so that's damaging. So now I will do the opposite where as an interviewer, you should be letting them do the majority of the talking, obviously not vice versa. And I'm shining a light on some of the more difficult, problematic and arduous parts of the role because they're going to find them out, right? Every role yeah. has them, those little bits hidden away. I get it all out before we ever hire them because if they still want the role after they've seen like it warts and all, well, then they're very likely going to be a good fit. So I'll almost try and actively scare them off by showing them the difficult bits and they're like, yeah, I'm still in. Then I'm like, cool, now we can talk. Yeah, well, I know like, I mean, so much about you and this is, you know, a parallel for me too. And so I, I really appreciate this about you, but I know that you happen to care a lot about community. You care a lot about sort of human to human relationships and all these kinds of things. A lot of the things that are sort of near and dear to my heart. So as a part of your hiring process, like I imagine there's a little bit of trying to check for culture fit too. You're trying to make sure that Absolutely. people sort of buy into this. So do you have any, I guess, any advice or any pointers? Like if you're hiring, hiring some creative talent, maybe they're going to work remotely so they don't have, or maybe you don't have the, the, you know, the ability to actually just sit down with them and get to know them in person the way you might somebody locally. Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of culture fit? Because I imagine even if you're not trying to sell the position too hard, you know, there's some things about your personality that probably just come out, you know, namely this stuff about, you know, personal relationships and the value of people and community and that kind of stuff. And I imagine if somebody's just not into that, it's not a fit. And so I, I wonder yeah. how you how you sort of navigate that. Cultural fits the most important thing. So we need people that are ridiculously talented and good, but I don't care if they're a genius. If they're not a good cultural fit, they can't join the team. And if they end up not being a nice person, then I fire them. Like, it's as simple as that. It's too precious. We've worked so hard for our culture. And we, um, we do an internal survey, like anonymous survey within the team every three months. So people really get very candid because they don't attribute their name to it. And that's like to do with their job satisfaction and the culture and so on. We just had record scores. Like it's always good and it's been going in a positive direction. Unbelievably good with job satisfaction and culture fit. And that's during a pandemic. So I was really proud of that. And we're fiercely protective of our culture for that reason. So we've had people that seem so good technically and nice enough, but we might get like a little red flag personality wise and we won't give them the job. Like we, are, we refuse to settle. And there's a few things that we use for that. So first of all, I'm looking for someone that's genuine. We've had people that have basically screwed up their interview because they've been so nervous they're tripping over their words and we've still given them the job because I sat them down and said look I can see you're nervous as hell but I get the impression you're honest and you're a great person so I don't care if you're nervous or you don't like interviews that's fine we've had other people that are super polished and slick but have a little edge to them and I'm like nah you're not going to be a good fit. You're going to end up like, you know, ruffling feathers or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's important. I think red flags, uh, everything. And it's like in a relationship, you get the honeymoon phase and then things go more wrong or get more difficult down the line, oftentimes, or certainly less perfect. The honeymoon phase is the interview and probation period in a hiring process. And so if you're in an interview and there's like the tiniest shred of doubt or something that doesn't sit well with you, experience tells me that that exponentially then expands into the future. So if they make a offhand remark that seems like a bit sharp with someone, previously I'd be like, oh, they probably didn't mean it. Whereas now I recognize that in 18 months time, that's gonna be them being an office bully or mm -hmm talking bad behind another team member's back or something that tiny moment's going to get a lot bigger in the future so that's some of the things we look for and then we actually have <laughs> the fun phase of the interview um after they pass all the other phases and it goes well we previously did this sat on the sofas in our office now, now we do it on a gigantic zoom floor we get them to meet the whole rest of the team just to double validate cultural fit and the whole team one by one fire a question at them that's like a silly random personal question so it, it might be boring stuff like what's your favorite drink or your favorite food or it might be like if you had to be one of the spice girls like which one would you be and why or like 
if you had to like have a superpower or something like that. And so you can kind of, I just sit back and watch this phase and really enjoy watching because it's like, you see how they interact. You see like, can they think on their feet and give good answers? But more importantly, are they nice to everyone? Do they bounce off everyone? Do they click? And then we ask the team after they've been through that and say, honestly, guys, share whatever you want. What did you think of them? And I truly appreciate their feedback and listen to them. And normally we're always on the same page. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great observation, a great tool. And um, there's this component or this thing that you mentioned, this idea of sort of the office bully. And it occurs to me that in sort of a virtual environment that, you know, you could be pretty sneaky, like you could be sort of poisoning the well without a, a manager, for, you know, for example, recognizing that this is going on for some time, you know, because it'd be pretty easy to slip little DMs into people's Slack channels or whatever, and, you know, sort of drop these little notes, you know, and sort of poison the well. And so I think, you know, maybe more than ever, this cultural fit is critical. And I, I like the way that you're doing it with, you know, sort of getting everybody involved in sort of this familial aspect, because I think that that's such a, I mean, it's a great way to handle creative people, but I think it's also a really, uh, really good, like people first approach. Yeah, it's really important. So I wonder, as we just sort of keep moving through this conversation, you know, again, we're trying to help, you know, maybe companies find great remote creative talent. You know, what do you think sort of the future of work looks like for, you know, creative people? So, I mean, obviously you guys are hiring for specific roles within your organization, but if you could speak maybe a little more broadly about sort of just business in general, and as you see, you know, just any industry trends or things that you're recognizing, what do you think a creative job is going to look like in the future? I mean, are we, are we heading into strictly gig economy? We're niching down and, and really picking your profession or your uh, specialty is going to be where it's at? Or there's still going to be a home for generalists or what do you what do you think is going to happen in the uh, near term and maybe further down the road i think creatives are gonna learn the hard way to uh protect themselves against vulnerability is the reality of it so we don't think about our vulnerabilities when everything's doing super well with the economy or with our career or whatever we just ride that high it's only when things get really tough like they are unfortunately now for so many that our vulnerabilities come to the surface. And so I think people and creatives in particular are gonna try and patch these vulnerabilities, if you will, uh, in several ways. I think we will see a upsurge in the number of freelancers and that kind of gig economy as well, um, out of necessity because there aren't as many jobs in house and we're already seeing this, you know, it's like, it's to be honest, it's really sad, it's, it's chaos out there. Like we're lucky enough to be hiring, but the pool of talent, everyone's been made redundant. It's really, really scary times. And so, um, yeah, I think a lot of people are going to shift to freelance. I think um, being super adaptable is going to be one of the greatest traits. And I've you know, been privileged to witness a lot of creatives nail this during the pandemic, where people have pivoted from serving one sector like hospitality, airlines, et cetera, that's near as damn it gone under. And they pivoted their entire client-based business model, what have you, to a more frothy, successful sector in record time, you know, before they might have dragged their feet for months, they've done it in weeks or days even. And so I think that um, that adaptive trait is going to be one that's kind of bred into creatives at the minute. Um, and then I think people setting up things like diversification of income, passive income, trying to have some of their own stuff going on. So it's not entirely predicated on clients. Um, I think that will happen more and more. And that's been a growing trend regardless. But again, stuff like this, I think there's going to be an upsurgence in it because no one wants to suddenly, like I, I had a call before this, Ryan, where someone ran a creative agency and all the marketing budgets got cut. So, you know, it's, it's basically crippled them. You don't want to be in that position. And after going through something that hard, you're going to do everything in your power to alleviate that risk and protect against those vulnerabilities for the rest of your life, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I, I, I agree with you that there's going to be sort of an influx in freelance talent. And I think, you know, as you know, recognizing that if that is sort of what the future of things are, how can freelancers and people like that stand out, you know, and maybe we can look at sort of the narrow scope of just, you know, for you at Design Cuts, if you're out there scouting and you're looking for people, how can somebody who, who might be freelancing now to make ends meet, but would be thrilled to sort of land something more permanent? How can they be, I guess, positioning themselves to be noticed? So I, I, I see a lot of creative people, you know, and I'm guilty of doing this myself, you know, where we'll submit work to, you know, forums and things like this where mostly designers hang out, right? So it's a little bit, you know, 
I guess, self-fulfilling. Everybody there is sort of there to kind of build one another up and things like that. But I don't know how much it actually contributes to the hiring process. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, these individuals, you know, especially people in sort of, you know, I don't know, hard to reach parts of the world, places that are maybe a little financially or, or otherwise war-torn or, or, you know, disparate. And these folks are, are maybe looking for positions, you know, in the more developed world, maybe in Europe or in the United States or something. How could they stand out in a crowd among all these other great designers that are, you know, now freelancing and everybody looking for work? The short answer is be better and be different. And to elaborate on those, it staggers me how lazy most people's approach tends to be because we've hired a lot of people and we've seen a lot more applications and the number of people, especially if it's a down economy who are like, dear sir or madam, I am inquiring about working at your company. And they've clearly spanned their CV out to 5,000 companies. The people that stand out and go the extra mile, which is always less crowded are the ones that put in the extra effort and work for that so you know we've also had people that have clearly done an enormous amount of homework on us and done a custom application and crafted it in an incredibly compelling creative way where it does break through the noise and it does demonstrate all kinds of qualities like i did a whole um podcast episode on this with mike janda with our show biz buds right we talked for an hour on this one thing because most people are really bad at this, unfortunately. And I think people need to educate themselves on like, you know, what employers want to see. They want to see you've done your homework. They want to see that you're not just another name in a crowd. They want to see something different and fresh and interesting. They want to see traits like you're willing to put in the work and think outside the box and, and this kind of thing. And the, um, the podcast I alluded to earlier that I listened to, the host runs a very successful social media agency and someone that was desperate to work there. And it's very competitive. You know, they get hundreds of people applying for each role, basically watched all of the company vlogs and then remade their entire office out of Lego by piecing together different bits of the vlog around their office oh, wow. and sent it to them in a box as a gift. Um, and it was so impressive. The CEO got called over the team gathered around. They took pictures It made it in the next vlog that broke through and became a line of communication. And I've encouraged many of my students to do this kind of bespoke offering and you can do it for a you know, nominal amount of money. It's just, you know, maybe a few hours of your time. And it's about that depth, right? Don't go and apply for 5,000 jobs, apply for one, maybe two or three to get started with, but go super deep and really commit an effort into trying to wow those people. And, and from your side, really figure out what's going to be a, a good fit for you. Don't just cast a wide net out of desperation, actually really hone in like what company is going to be a great fit where I'm truly going to feel happy and then deploy the effort to actually cut through the noise. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And it's funny that you say that because it hadn't pre previously really occurred to me, although this is something I've done sort of in my own life um, prior to moving to Utah, which is where I live now. Uh, eight years ago, I basically was working for myself. I had what I called, you know, a, a design agency, but I'd never actually set foot in one and uh, and was working out of Pocatello, Idaho, a small little town north of here. And um, basically, I did that same thing. I, I cast a fairly narrow net to about 10 different agencies, and I offered basically a month of design work for free in exchange for being a fly on the wall in meetings and learning how an agency works. And, uh, you know, I only had one taker, but that one taker has now been for the last eight years on and off. I mean, they were my employer for three years, and now they're one of my top freelance clients for the last seven. So That's it's... Awesome. Been, you know, so I mean, it's pretty incredible, but I mean, it's exactly what you're saying. Basically, you know, I, I sort of made an offer of myself. I was willing to give something. And obviously you couldn't do that at scale, right? I couldn't do that to 500 agencies or a thousand agencies, yeah. but I, I could do it to 10 that were sort of within a zone that was near enough that I could drive down and work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and luckily I, I was, you know, I, I mean, I only heard from one of them. So, I mean, the one that, that accepted my offer also is the only one that responded to me. So maybe after those 10, maybe you have to expand your net a little bit or go to the next 10 or something. But I imagine if you're doing anything in this Lego example you, you showed is, is pretty incredible. Um, I mean, we just super quick, Ryan, we actually had our own version of that. So a guy called Benji sent us a hamper box thing that he'd custom made up 
and it included this beautifully printed um, portfolio inside, but it also included a few like sweet treats and that kind of thing and a handwritten note that said how he listened to every episode of the Honest Designers Show, which is our company podcast, and how it was addressed to me as one of the hosts and the founder of the company and saying the impact it had had on his life and how much he appreciated it. Um, and it was just this incredible thing. And, and similar to the other example, I got my team around and everyone was like, oh my God, this is nuts. Like this guy put so much effort in to the point we weren't even hiring, but myself and my creative director brought him into the office, met him, took him out for lunch and paid for his lunch and gave him as and said sorry we don't have any jobs going truly but if we did we definitely you know would hire you we gave him as much career and interview advice as we can and then he took that and applied for another local company and got the job and all of that came from like this beautiful gesture instead of him spamming his cv like every other person yeah it makes sense and i mean even you know back to my experience it was sort of that also i mean basically i didn't come to work for that agency until two years later but as soon as they had an opening, I was the first guy they called. Yeah. And, uh, and so, but it was because of that effort and because of that introduction. Um, just to sort of, I guess, as we're uh, winding down here a little bit, I want to touch on the other part. So I think that that sort of fills the be better bucket, this idea of, you know, go above and beyond the other person. But I want to talk just quickly about the be different bucket. So I think a lot of times when, you know, especially like among designers and things like that, like if you're a graphic designer, your mentality a lot of time is, well, I can design anything. I could just do whatever it is that comes. So basically, you know, I don't have a, you know, specialty per se. But, you know, one of the things, and we've alluded to it a little bit earlier in this conversation, is this idea of niching down or sort of choosing your niche. And so I wonder if you just talk a little bit, you know, if you're, again, you're this designer, maybe you've done something a little better, but maybe you don't know how to focus your skill set so that you can sort of choose the one to really push your marketing on versus trying to be this jack of all trades. I wonder if you could talk just briefly about how people can sort of actually be different, how they might choose that niche. Because I think for a lot of people who feel like they're very capable of doing a lot of things, it's really difficult to choose the one. Yeah, niching is a big subject, um, to be honest. But one of the main things I want to say about it is people regard it to be um, this huge kind of ultimatum type decision which then locks them into a life sentence. So they think, oh my God, I need to get this perfectly right. I'm gonna do this niche and then that's gonna be my career defined. And of course that's really scary and it doesn't have to be that at all. I actually think it needs to be your kind of first step in the right direction, even if it's a really small step. And then it should be an ongoing iterative process forever with the freedom that allows you to pivot anytime. You can mix it up and choose a totally different niche in the future if you want or you can make little changes as you go. And that makes it a lot less scary and more comprehensible for people. So how do you do that first step? It's like, well, you, you look inside and you try and think, what am I best at? What am I most passionate at? And then you try and marry that with the market conditions. So if someone's super passionate about airlines, again, maybe not the best fit right now because that sector is just going through a really rough time. But if you can find a sector where you're really passionate about the people in it, you can resonate with them. They're your kind of people. You'd love to work for people like that and deal with people like that. It's an area which lights you up. You're really good at talking about that kind of stuff. And maybe you're not so passionate about identity design, but you love web design or something like that. Well, all of these kind of introspective thoughts start to get you on the right path. And again, you don't need to pivot your entire career overnight. I'm working with someone right now, uh, one of my coaching students who has been doing Squarespace websites and she's a bit fed up with Squarespace. So she's still going to continue to do websites and work with similar types of clients, but she's kind of pivoting away from Squarespace and starting to do more stuff like Webflow. And then her next step is she's kind of starting to do work for more of the clients which she likes and the sectors she enjoys and say no more to the ones she doesn't. And again, that wasn't a final point of like no return. It's an ongoing thing where a previous client she might have said yes to, she's now like, you know what? This doesn't fit my new direction I'm on. I'm going to say no, I'm going to hold out. And then another client comes along a week later. Yeah, they're more a good fit. So it's this intentional kind of just slow drift towards where you want to get. And I think if you do that, as I say, iteratively and consistently and proactively over time, then your happiness and success will compound. Yeah, no, I think that th that's right. And I think that, you know, you, you really hit the, the uh, nail here with the, 
what it is that I think is scary to designers when they're choosing this niche, right? Is I think a lot of them feel like it's this all or nothing game. Like, you know, I, I'm either this guy or I'm not that guy. I also think there's a little bit of identity that gets wrapped up in this. You know, I'm the guy who's known for X. So yeah. now if I try and do Y, like, you know, who, who am I then, right? You know, so I think that there's some stuff like that, but I think your approach that you mentioned, this idea of sort of being a little bit more iterative and back to this, you know, recurring theme of intention, sort of setting a new plan and saying, this is what I'm going to work towards, but understanding that it doesn't have to be done overnight. Like we can work on this over the next six months or the next year, or whatever you need to actually move into that niche, but um, you, you like, can do it. Ryan, see, cutting yeah, off. super quick, sorry to, um... Oh, sure. Sorry, sorry to interject. Um, you said you're 40, right? Yeah. So you're probably quite different as a guy mindset wise than you were at 20. Mm -hmm. But you didn't suddenly wake up when you're 21 with the mind of a 40 year old and like, boom, done. Right. Yeah. It's been so gradual. You probably barely noticed it. But I'd imagine there was a degree of thought put into that introspection trying to shape yourself into the guy you want to be all that kind of stuff so now you wake up and you're 40 and and you're more that guy but it yeah. took time i think people need to think about their career more in that kind of sense mm -hmm. because you say niching there's this huge misconception of like oh you mean i'm gonna to have to design like sonic the hedgehog logos for the next 20 years of my career and go like <laughs> hyper niche or something like it's not about that it's more like who am i and what am i about and what kind of work do i actually want to be doing I don't want to do these low value clients anymore. Cool. I'm going to put in the work for six months to learn pricing and start working with higher value clients. That's one of the steps in the right direction of where I want to go. And after enough of those steps, it's night and day. It's transformation, but that transformation has been a gradual process. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really fair. And actually, I talk about this a lot. I uh, used to struggle a lot with sort of, you know, I guess trying to keep up with the Joneses or everybody looks like they got it better than I do or whatever. And so I used to struggle with it a lot. And I came up with this little phrase, which is basically it took every step I've ever taken in order for me to arrive at this moment, right? So basically, there was no other way for me to sit down and have this interview with Tom Ross, rather than 40 years of decisions that it's taken to get here, right? So there was no shortcut, there was no more rapid way, whatever. And I, I, I apologize, that, I feel like this is quite lackluster. <laughs> if your life until this point has been building up to this moment. <laughs> no, no, it, it's everything, right? Everything is, yeah. is this, right? And so like, there was no faster way for me to get to X, Y, or Z than the path I took. And by doing that, then I don't have to live in regret and feel like I could have done things differently or smarter or better. You know, nonetheless, it, it may have been a meandery road, but still it got us here. And so, and I think that some of that, and I think to your point, just kind of comes with being older too. I think there's stuff that at 20, you just can't know. You know, you don't have, you don't have the life experience to understand. You don't have this. And so you're listening to, you know, the, the Tom Rosses and the Chris Doe's and the whatever of the world. And, and for some of it, you know, it sounds great, but there's this, there's this difficult transition and this, this thing that I talk about all the time, which is this kind of wall where you can hear the words coming in and they sound beautiful and you feel like you know what you're doing, but you can't actually execute on what's coming in. And I think some of that is, you know, like you said, it's this iterative process. You have to learn about it and then apply a little bit and learn, earn, you know, learn some more and then apply some more. And I think just some of it just takes time. Like, you know, I mean, we would all love to sort of flip of the switch and be, you know, the Zuckerbergs of the world. But, you know, but I just don't think life is that way. And I think that, you know, beating ourselves up for not being where we should be at any given age or whatever, like, I mean, that's all kind of arbitrary. I honestly think it just takes, you know, living some life before you can actually get to where you're supposed to be. No exceptions. No one is that linear straight path to the destination. Everyone meanders. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, you know, a really good point. And I think it's important for people to recognize, especially creative people who tend to bounce around a little bit. We spend a lot of time dreaming and thinking about where we could be, or what if we did this, or what if we did that? And sometimes, you know, I mean, like, at least from my own experience, I get super scattered at any given time. I've got three or four different business ideas I'm trying to kind of work on and, and all these things. And, you know, it's just, um, I think sort of the nature of life, but I think, you know, over time you start to figure out what clicks for you. You know, I may be trying to build three or four different businesses, but really if you boil each of them down, they're sort of, you know, at least tangentially related. They've all got a little bit of crossover, right? Because there's sort of a core skill set or a core competency that exists that I'm working within. So even though it feels really disparate, like there's all these different things, we're still actually kind of talking about the same thing. And so, um, and I think for a lot of creatives, it's sort of that, right? We, we may not be able to sort of distill down what is our core competency, but I think most of us sort of hover in and around what our favorite things are anyway. I completely agree. 
And oh, cool. you, you, you know what, Ryan? Like, I almost didn't say this because I don't want to come off as patronizing, but I mean, this is like a very sincere compliment. Um, you strike me as one of the most articulate podcast hosts that I've dealt with because I do a lot of these interviews and, and this kind of thing, and everyone has a different style. And listening to you talk, you get my brain racing in a really good way. It's like I, I did English as a, a degree. It's like talking to a, an English major. I, I like that <laughs> things. And I, okay, I mean that in a sincere then. way. I hope that comes across as intended. No, and I'm, I'm so glad that you said it too while we're taping because uh, I would hate to have to go back and be like, guys, you won't believe what Tom said. So I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled that you, guys, that you said that. And thank you so much. I appreciate the compliment. So as, as we're winding things down, Tom, let's just uh, give people a little heads up. Where can they go track you down? How can they get involved? Where can they you know, see the work that you're doing? And, and especially if they're a creative person who's looking to find a remote career, or, uh, you know, I, or I guess an in-person career, you know, if you can actually find one these days, you know, um, where can people learn more about you, the work you're doing and, uh, and sort of get involved? Um, well, first of all, huge thank you, Ryan. I've really enjoyed this chat and thank you for having me on the show. Um, the best places are designcuts.com is, uh, like say the greatest design marketplace in the world. That's my baby, my company. I'm Tom Ross media on all social media with my personal brand. And then definitely check out BizBuds If you're listening to this, you're clearly a podcast fan. And that's where I put my absolute best content when it comes to business and marketing. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Well, and you've teamed up with a great guy too. I think Janda is a, a terrific resource for a lot of people also, especially if you are interested in sort of the entrepreneurial side of design and you're really looking how to, you know, sell the work you do. I think he's a, he's a great resource. So, Try working uh, with the guy. <laughs> yeah, I can only I'm imagine. I'm kidding. For, for anyone that doesn't have context, Mike and I razz each other. We've got brotherly love going on. No, Mike's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, cool. Well, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate uh, appreciate you. All the work you're doing is, is incredible. Please keep it up. I think you're doing a lot of good for uh, the creative community and, uh, you know, I think the greater sort of human community at large. So I think you're uh, leading by example and it's a, it's a really refreshing look. So uh, th that means thanks. a lot. Absolutely. And, uh, and thanks so much to everybody who's tuned in this week and every week. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. I don't know you anything